Welcome to Shooting Spaces, a real estate photography podcast. Discussions on gear, technique, industry news, and interviews with the best in the business. Now, here are your hosts, Rich Baum and Brian Berkowitz. Hello, and welcome to Shooting Spaces. I'm Brian Berkowitz from New York. And this is Rich Baum from Sacramento, California. And we thank you for joining us today for another fantastic episode with another great guest. But as usual, before we get into it, Rich, how's it going out there in uh, smoky California or has the smoke? uh, It's been beautiful. I am so stoked. My wife was just in uh, Seattle, said it, it is unbelievably bad. So everything has blown north of us. And uh, I guess Washington has their own fires. So it's been great. I've been busy. Um, summer's kind of winding down. It's been under 100 this week. So it's really nice. And I'm just stoked. And uh, I got to say, man, y- you posted something and I saw it. You shot a, uh, a like a giant hotel this week. What did you shoot? It wasn't a hotel, but I remember you uh, texted me after and you said, is that a hotel? I said, no, that's actually a house. (laughs) But yeah, it was a gigantic house on probably uh, 10 acres. Um, I shot for the landscape architect. It was was like a $280,000 landscape architectural project, something like that, something insane. And I'm excited. The the property is being submitted to Architectural Digest um, as an article along with my photos. So hopefully we uh, get accepted. It'll be great. Have you been in Architectural Digest yet? I have not yet, okay. so I'm hoping. I'm hoping. Fingers well, that's, crossed. That's two of us, so I <laughs> yeah. look forward to it. Great. So, uh, what's going on this week, uh, Brian? Who do you, who do we have? We have an interview, right? Yeah, we do have an interview. We have a fantastic guest with us today. His name is Greg Benz. I'm sure a lot of you might know him from the various facebook groups around all the different photography groups so greg came out with i guess you can call it a software but it's a photoshop extension to help ease the pain of luminosity masking which i know is pain for everybody um, especially if you're not proficient in it so obviously we'll get into it but without further ado greg why don't you uh introduce yourself and uh, tell us a little bit about you and uh, maybe where they can find some of your work because i know you're a photographer also as well absolutely hey guys well thanks for having me on Uh, Again, my name is Greg Benz. I'm a landscape photographer primarily based out of uh, Minneapolis. I do a lot of landscape and cityscape work, Uh, certainly do some uh, interiors, but that's not uh, my primary uh, photography work. I've kind of done a little bit of everything over the years, probably 50 weddings, so on. Uh, So a lot of of different genres I've played with, but that's kind of my, my home base. Uh, And, and as you'd mentioned, um, I'm very focused on luminosity masking as a general technique and uh, am a software developer on top of being a photographer and instructor. So I kind of cover three different bases. It's kind of an unusual combination, but um, keeps me uh, engaged and it's kind of kind of fun for me to to cover all those different areas. Great. So why don't we get right into it? And for people who are not familiar with luminosity masking and that technique, and you know, I I know I personally and Rich also, as mentioned, he uses it when needed. Um, especially, I think for us, a lot of a lot of the benefit is for sky replacement. And you can tell me if you agree with that, Greg, or not. But what is luminosity masking? What's the the technique? What's the theory behind it? Um, for those who are not familiar. So it, it tends to mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And the reason for that is it's basically making selections or masks, but just with a higher quality or a different way. So really anything you could do with a selection or a mask in Photoshop is something you could do with a luminosity selection or mask. The difference is that if you use, say, like the magic wand tool in Photoshop, you're just going to pick up the sky and everything's going to be 100% selected. Whereas if you use a luminosity selection... It's going to select, you know, the bluer parts of the sky or the brighter parts of the sky or however you want to define it. It will select those more than other areas and sort of naturally transition. So what you end up getting is the ability to make masks and selections from the image content, but in a much more natural way. It's a little bit like taking the magic wand and and putting it on steroids. Once you have that, you can do all sorts of stuff. So within real estate, Certainly, you could do sky replacements. You could uh, blend in windows for for interiors. That's something that a lot of people ask me about. It could be restoring highlights and blown lamps. It could be... You think about the mixed color temperature you get when you shoot an interior and the inside is very warm and the exterior is very blue. Well, you could process the same image with two different color temperatures and blend it together to 
to fix that cast because uh, a luminosity mask or selection isn't just about the luminosity in the image. It can be about the color. So there's a lot of different ways you can define it, but essentially it's just giving you a more natural way to interact with the content of your image based on what color it is or how bright it is. Interesting. I never thought to use luminosity masks to do uh, window pulls. And I know Rich has his uh, own technique, which uh, is now world famous. But um, besides for that, uh, you know, that'd definitely be something I would definitely want to try is using luminosity masks for window pulls because I've never really even thought to do that. Yeah, that's some really interesting information, Greg. And um, I really look forward to trying your product. The uh, Lumen What is it? How do you pronounce it? Lumenzia? Lumenzia. Great name, by the way. Um, yeah, I, I know that I do a lot of masking in what I teach people in my day-to-day -day real estate photography because I'm always taking um, an ambient exposure and a flash exposure. And then I mask in the parts of the ambient that I need to help with the various uh, parts of the f the flash image, uh, which would be one of three things. It would be logical shadows, I call it, or it would be um, uh, it, it would be the luminosity, you know. And uh, I think I think that the problem I've got is I would love to use. I, I try it all the time when I do masking. I usually use normal mode in in Photoshop, and when I use it in luminosity mode. Um, it, it just kind of more times than not, it leaves really weird artifacts. I was just editing a photo 30 minutes ago and I tried, I said, heck, I'm going to try luminosity mode. So I switched it from normal to luminosity and it's, it just has these, where the color would be, it just has these weird artifacts. So I don't know what that's all about, but I've kind of settled for um, just doing more normal masking. So I'd like to know, uh, you know, how do you deal with uh, the colors that are coming in from the ambient that we don't like, like uh, like the warmth from tungsten lights, the the oranges and yellows. Uh, how can your product just bring in the luminosity, bring in the exposure for that area? Uh, sure. And so, just to clarify one one quick thing, so you're talking about the blend mode of the layer when you talk about Correct. normal or yeah. luminosity blend mode, meaning the the luminance of that layer and how mm -hmm. it blends. When I talk about luminosity masks or selections, I'm talking about the technique used to create the mask, but the mask itself doesn't have a, a mode. It, it's not um, normal or whatever. It's, it's always just a grayscale image that kind of defines what you see mm -hmm. on that layer. Um, so when I talk about luminosity masks, uh, I'm, I'm basically saying this generic way of taking the image content and basically selecting things by how close they are to my ideal. So if I want highlights, it'll pick up all the highlights and some of the midtones and none of the shadows, for example. Or if I'm dealing with an orange lamp, I'll pick up the orange part of the lamp and maybe a little bit of the yellow next to it, you know, but probably none of the green plant next to that kind of thing. So it's, it's just giving you this way to sort of naturally transition mm -hmm. from the thing you want to work on and avoid working on the other stuff or, or vice versa. So if you had a, some sort of an orange color cast... For example, in Lemenzi, you can create a mask or selection based on orange, yellow, red, or some combination of those things, and then you could work on that. So if you had a mixed color temperature because there's a lamp in one corner, you could start selecting things that are more orange and then start desaturating or blending mm -hmm. in a cooler color temperature or something like that. But it's not, it's not that um, luminosity masks or selections do anything. It's that they let you work more precisely. So you're still making the same adjustments you would otherwise make, but you're able to make them through a stencil, basically. So it, it's just giving you much more precision to, to make that edit without obvious edges, um, which can also mean that it's not only a better result, but you can also get there faster because if you have you know, kind of guardrails around the work you're doing, then you can work a little bit faster, not worry that you're spilling over and darkening outside of the window that you're trying to blend mm -hmm. in or something like that. Great. Well, that sounds really exciting for me. I would uh, love it. And uh, do you have videos? I find that uh, I judge companies by their videos. You know, there, some companies have just terrible tutorials and I rely on the tutorials so much. And I know from doing tutorials myself, it's so, it's so important. Uh, do you have a lot of uh, tutorials? On your oh, website? yeah. I, I've been posting on YouTube for probably 
four plus years. I think I, I've between my website and YouTube, I've got over a hundred different mm. videos that are out there. There's a bunch of videos that come with Lumenzia. I've got a separate course on how to blend exposures, which is something we could talk about if you want to dive into that a little bit. Um, and, and that's a whole separate collection of, of videos. So I, I don't know how many I have, but it's a lot. It's a big number. <laughs> And um, how long have you had your product? When did you release it? Um, it's been out now for about three and a half years. I started working on it in back in, I think, 2014. So it was, it was kind of a pet project of mine um, that I worked on for a while before I got really serious and, and launched it. So I've, I sort of lose track of where it all started and, and ended. But it, it, I launched, if I remember correctly, in February of 2015. And it's just been continuously updated since then. So it's a tool that I use every day for my own work. So I'm obviously motivated to help my customers out, but it's also the tool that I use every day. So whenever I'm working on my images, if I run into something that could be a little bit better, I'm, I'm just constantly tweaking and improving it. Yeah, I think you're up to version six already now, correct? I am. And the versioning app's a little bit funny because when I first came out with it, version one, everything was like 1.1, 1 1.2, et cetera. So <laughs> I think I've actually had about maybe 14 different versions that I've released, major versions. So it's it's really been uh, fast paced. And in fact, one, one of the things I've tried to focus on in the last few releases is really minimizing how much the interface changes. So, you know, trying to make it where it keeps getting better, but without mm -hmm. you know, disrupting anyone's workflow and just keeping it simpler. Because at the end of the day, that's what I'm trying to do is simplify the workflow. So, Well, I know that sometimes I will just avoid doing something because it's like, uh, oh, if it's not broke, don't fix it. And it's, uh, I'm just personally maxed out technically. Uh, I have, I'm dealing with so many things uh, technically that I just, you know, it's really difficult nowadays. Keep it simple, you know? Yeah, I, I have this mentality of constantly trying to optimize whatever I'm doing, whether it's uh, the way I create my website, my software, my photos. Um, you know, I've only been doing this full time now for a couple of years. I've been doing photography for like 18 years. So I'm, I'm in this really steep, you know, pace, uh, learning curve for my own self in terms of just focusing on it all day, every day. And, um, I'm just constantly trying to improve things. So it's, it's kind of that struggle of, uh, you know, when do you, when do you just kind of hone what you're doing and, and when do you just kind of go back and, uh, kind of crank out on the same things you've done before. Mm -hmm. So Greg, I want to jump into Lumenzia itself now, now that, um, hopefully people have a little bit of an understanding of, of, what lumin luminosity masks are and how they uh, allow you to be so precise in your images. So first off, Lumenzia is not a software, correct? A standalone software. It's an extension for Photoshop. Is that correct? It, it is software, but it, it, it requires Photoshop. It's not standalone. So it's technically what they call an extension panel. It's basically um, JavaScript. So it's, it's advanced code, but it, it lives within Photoshop. So it's a, I mean, I know this, but I'm telling the audience, it's basically a panel, just like your actions panel or your history panel or anything, or your layers panel, anything like that. You just have a panel that says Lumenzia. Exactly. In fact, there, there's actually uh, two panels. So I've got kind of a secondary panel of things that are maybe more for beginners or, or for people who don't know the, the keyboard shortcuts. And it just gives you some options in terms of how you work with it. We briefly got into luminosity masking and the power it has by, you know, allowing you to you know, make selections based off, you know, color or light. How does Lumenzia, I mean, what's the, what's the concept behind Lumenzia and, and the purpose? Why would it speed up my workflow or anyone's workflow for that matter? Well, whether it speeds up your workflow or not depends on kind of your, your end goal. And, and I think you guys are in a unique spot with a real estate where you've got kind of the high end of real estate where people are going to go for the ultimate quality. And then you've got the other end of real estate where people have serious time constraints. So, it's always tricky. So with luminosity masks, there are areas where it can speed you up and there's areas where it can speed, slow you down because mm -hmm. you, know, you may be kind of chasing uh, too high of a bar quality wise. And um, so it really depends on what you're trying to do with the image. But uh, for example, yeah, some of the areas where it might speed you up a bit, let's say that you wanted to um, deal with color cast. So I mentioned you know, before the scenario where the interior lighting is very warm and the outside lighting is very blue. Well, I could take an image and I could process it once in Lightroom for the exterior. So I make the outside properly white balanced. And then I could process it again for the interior to make the walls, the desk, and everything else properly white balanced. And you can combine those two you know, perfectly in Lumenzia in you know, just a few seconds, really, where it'll help you pick one over the other. 
Uh, and I'm not going to tell you that it works every single time. I mean, there's, you know, it's kind of a toolkit approach. So, you know, every image is going to have different challenges. But for the most part, you could quickly grab those two images and blend the properly white balance area of one image with the rest of the image from the other version of it, for example. Mm -hmm. Interesting. <laughs> Now, what I like about Lumenzia is that, you know, I, I guess you can call them presets, but you call them presets, you have a ton of different presets built in for mid-tones, light, and darker shades, but then you also have the option of different colors as well as just the color picker. So your, your options are kind of endless. So obviously, you know, this is an audio podcast and nothing visual, but can you kind of just, you know, give us try to, vi you know, as you speak, hopefully people can try to visualize um, what Lumenzia is and like a walkthrough on, on how a workflow would go if someone was using Lumenzia. Yeah. So Lumenzia has, you know, a bunch of different buttons on it, but they really are grouped into three areas. It kind of does three things. There's the first part where you preview what you want to do. So that would be where you'd click and say, I want to take a look at highlights, or maybe I want a more restrictive version of the highlights, or I want to look at the yellow highlights or something like that. You you pick what you want to work on and then you can go and apply it to something like a curves adjustment or blending your layers or whatever you want to do. You can take that preview, which is going to be a full screen preview of the mask or selection and turn it into a mask or selection. So you, know, you could have a selection and start painting on it to uh, or painting through it to blend exposures or you could turn it into a mask on a curves adjustment in order to start bringing down some nearly blown highlights in a lamp or something like that. Uh, and then the third part is where you're going to refine what you've done. So, you know, you've, you've done the preview, you've gone and, and kind of done your rough pass to apply it. And the third part will allow you to tweak things and further refine it. So for example, I could go in and select the light parts of the image, start adjusting them, and then go and refine it to say, Hey, I don't just want the light parts. I want the parts that are light and blue to better isolate it and avoid changing, you know, the white wall or something like that. And you can do that after you've already created your curves adjustment, for instance, with the mask. Yeah. So um, it, it's going to depend on what you're doing. There's many different variations of that theme, but yeah, absolutely. So it's it's very much um, open ended, and and you can kind of go in in many different directions. But I, I kind of guide people through the general workflow is to get this, you know, on-screen preview of what you're going to do, go do something with it and then here are the options to enhance it and and make it better. Cool. Now, I know um there are other options out there that do similar to what you do like Lumenzia. I don't know who they are. I've seen them around, but um I do own Lumenzia. I don't I couldn't even tell you I bought it a while ago. I couldn't even tell you why I chose your software over the others. But on that note, um, what makes your software shine over the others? Um, I know I'm happy with the results I get. And when I started, I was very intimidated by Lumenzia. And I honestly don't know it as well as I should. I should probably have to go back and watch all your tutorials again and really um, get really proficient in it. But, you know, do you have features or is it just, you know, user interface, ease of use? What makes you shine more than um, some of the other competitors you have out there? Well, I, I won't make any direct comparisons. I don't think that'd be really fair. I haven't really tried uh, everyone else's product. Um, it, in fact, I haven't tried most of them. I'm, I'm generally familiar, but my focus is on trying to make it as simple as possible. So I've really focused on trying to give the user less things to think about, give them a much more intuitive visual interface, help it automatically deal with problems in the background, give you helpful hints when you need them, that sort of thing. So luminosity mass and selections will never be in, in an absolute sense an easy thing to do but i've tried as much as possible to use all the back end power of javascript in the panel to make it as easy as possible um what i hear from a lot of my customers is they just like how it's very compact and straightforward and you know it it even though it has a lot of buttons it's it's really not as many so i think a lot of people kind of comment to me that they find it uh, simple in relationship. But a lot of people tell me that they use multiple different products and they like all of them for different reasons. So I, I, I know many customers actually just buy multiple products and kind of try them all and continue using multiple different ones for different reasons. And I bet the learning curve is probably pretty quick. What do you feel about that? 
Um, I would say that if you know luminosity masks, you could sit right down and start using Lumenzia, no problem. I, and, and I think that's generally probably true of any of these products. I, I can't say that for sure, but what's hard about luminosity masking is not the tool. I mean, all these tools make things simpler. And I've tried to do a lot of things to make Lumenzia simpler and also more flexible where you can really customize it to the nth degree, however you want. But where I think a lot of people get maybe kind of turned around is just understanding the general idea of how these grayscale masks that it creates work. And so, for example, a lot of people want to try and you know blend in a darker exposure from the outside to fix a blown window. And Lomenzia can, can do that you know, very easily in certain ways, but you have to understand the general principles of how you should approach blending. And so there, there is a bit of a learning curve there. I don't want to downplay you know, how easy that is. But you know, once you get over that learning curve, then you can move you know, pretty quickly through it and do some really advanced stuff. Um, mm-hmm. and, and like I said, I, I'm, you know, I'm always trying to make it easier and, and continue to simplify things. But you know, it's, it's the deeper end of Photoshop for sure. Mm-hmm. What, I, what I like about Lumenzia um, in the little time that I've used it is, like you mentioned briefly, is the preview option because, um, I mean, I guess you can call it non-destructive even though, you know, with history states, I guess most of Photoshop is now non-destructive if you're using layers or whatever the case is. But you get to preview the different, if you want to call them presets or buttons on your panel and see which mask you think will work best for your specific image before you actually decide that you want to go ahead and apply that to your adjustment layer. Yeah, that, that's something that I think really kind of, you know, has been a central focus for me with Lomenzi is making it very visual, not just for the preview, but also to customize it. So you could, for example, go and select the lighter areas of the image because you're trying to work on a particular wall or something. But if that's, you know, that selection, when you click one of the buttons in Lamenti is not exactly what you want, you can go in and refine it to be a little bit more inclusive of the yellows and maybe reject more of the greens and, you know, go for specific luminosity values, depending on how bright the light is shining on that wall or how you've processed it. So you can sit there and interactively, you know, include more or less of different brightness values or different colors in the image and see exactly what you're going to get for a mask or selection. And I just find that very intuitive. And generally, that's the feedback I hear from people is they, they really like that aspect of it. Now, I'm looking through your, I guess it's your blog on your website as we speak. And um, it looks like almost all your posts are just different videos or tutorials on how to do things. So it's pretty awesome that you just have so much content out there. So even if you're new to Lumenzia and um, a little intimidated, which I admit I was when I first started and still am a little bit. Um, there's just so much videos that you've posted and it should make uh, that transition a little bit easier. Yeah. And, and I post on a, a variety of different uh, Photoshop topics as well. So if you look at what I just released today, it's a tutorial on how to use the uh, the Puppet Warp, which is probably not the thing you're going to want to use in uh, real estate. But, uh, you know, I, I kind of cover a range of different things and obviously a lot of luminosity masking in there. Sure. Now, I know, obviously, um, we have you on to talk about Lumenzia, but um, before we run out of time, why don't you talk a little bit about your exposure blending master course? Because you did mention it earlier. So um, why don't you let us know what that is exactly and uh, if someone's interested in that? Yeah, I would say one of the biggest reasons that people jump into luminosity masking is they're looking to blend multiple exposures. And, and historically, that was HDR. You know, and some people love it. And a lot of people think it has a terrible name. And you know, I think there's good and bad examples within it. But a lot of people kind of try out HDR and they don't like the results. And then they figure out that, hey, you know, people are going and using luminosity masks to manually blend multiple exposures and they're getting better results. And that's where a lot of people come in. And that was sort of the, the heart of what I created around the Exposure Blending Master Course is how can you go and shoot a dark exposure and a light exposure and combine them together to get more out of it. But then sort of the, the hidden bigger part of the course that people aren't really asking, it's sort of that you know thing that I want to do for other photographers that they don't even know to ask is how to multi-process a single raw file. So when I talk about blending with Lumenzi and Luminosity masks, most of the time I'm shooting a single raw file, even if I'm shooting directly into the sunset. But what I'll do is I'll process it two or three or five different ways in Lightroom 
and then blend it together with itself. So I can get more shadow detail and better color and all sorts of great information out of the raw that you just can't get any other way. You know, I can go and push on the shadow slider, for example, in Lightroom, but I'll get better results if I create another version of it mm. where I maybe increase the exposure and then use a luminosity mask to blend it with the other version. Or for example, um, if I want to sharpen, you know, in a certain way in particular parts of the image and just the highlights, I can't do that in Lightroom, but I can blend it together in Photoshop. Or if I want to process the same image with different white balance values, like we talked about earlier, I can't do that in Lightroom, but I can blend it together, you know, with these luminosity masks and selections in, in Photoshop. So that's actually that concept of multiprocessing a raw file is something I really focus on quite a bit in the course because it um, lets you shoot in a more simple way. It lets you get a lot more detail out of your files. And um, ultimately, it just it's amazing what you can pull out of a single raw file when you mm -hmm. really you know, extract everything it has to give you. Well, yeah, the dynamic range in the cameras nowadays are, are incredible and it allows you to do that. But Rich, I know you shoot a lot of your Twilight single raw. Um, all of them. Is now. It, it, I mean, all of them. Unless I'm doing something, I haven't done a, I haven't done a, well, I, I'll use multiple layers if I have a bright light in front of the house. But um, no, most, almost everything I do is a single exposure. I just, we did uh, light painting tests and we, we light painted and then we did single exposure and then two or three exposures and then played around with them. And, and I just found that it just, the, the benefit did not justify the amount of time and energy. Uh, and I'm talking regular real estate photography. And uh, you know, a few other photographers too, we kind of jumped ship and went from the, uh, the light painting uh, train of thought to uh, go back to single exposures. And I'm amazed. Yeah, I, I now shoot with a Sony A3, A7 III and I shot something last night. The dynamic range is, I, I got to say, I, I, if I do say so myself, I think it's better than my Nikons. And uh, I think it's just three years newer than my D750, uh, the, the new Sony. So I think it's just everything keeps getting better and better. And are you processing rich off the one raw file or are you doing something similar to what Greg suggests, you know, creating two or three different exposures and blending them, or you're just doing everything straight up with one file? Well, in my workshops, I teach that there's certain things you can do. Uh, so it's almost uh, redundant, but you can take multiple exposures, let's say you, for your ambient exposure, and then uh, you can bring them in the Lightroom and then choose the exposure that you want. I always, you know, tell people to get the ammunition you need while you're out there. So just bracket your images if you need to. Uh, so you have all the different brackets. So when you get home and you thought that something was a little better than the other, than, it, than another one, uh, you have the other one just in case you need it. Uh, and another thing you can do is you can just duplicate, you know, virtual copies. We've all done that in Lightroom. And then just increase your exposure because, I mean, you can certainly uh, increase the exposure one, two stops in either direction, bring it up or bring it down. And you, you're, I mean, Maybe if like Greg is is pixel peeping and doing some beautiful landscape or something, you might see some degradation in the file. But in, in my day-to-day -day work, I think you can easily just duplicate a file in Lightroom and then change the exposure or change the colors of that exposure and then just mask in that area in Photoshop. So bring it in as, as multiple layers as in Photoshop and then just use the parts of each image that you want. But I, I kind of understand what you're talking about, Greg, and I really am going to need to sit down and spend some time when, when I get a little slower business-wise and really understand your product because I'm really excited about it. It's, uh, it really is, it intrigues me and I know a lot of people use it, so I'm going to probably try and start using it also. So, Well, and, and just to chime in on that, to, to give you a sense of how far you can push these raw files, because as a landscape photographer, I'm printing and selling my work and I routinely take images where I have, you know, three or more stops of shadow correction, meaning I take the shadows and I boost the exposure by that much, right? I've underexposed the shadows that much. And I'm printing these at 40 by 60 inches and they look great. Mm. You know, now you got to process them correctly. For example, I'll create a, a brighter version of the image. I'll throw a noise reduction on the brighter version to counteract the noise. And then when you print it, you know, if you pixel peep or on the monitor, yeah, you can see a difference, but in the finished print, you really don't at, at that level. And you always have the choice to go and shoot more frames, but I just 
tend to find it's not really worth it. So it's it's more or less the same process whether you're going to use multiple RAWs or not. But when you use that process, you have the option to work in a much simpler way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I just, if uh, I can break in here a second, I was just, if, if you're sitting out there listening in your car when you get home, check out Greg's website because uh, I'm a landscape fan and I'm actually right now, I'm moving all over to Sony and uh, I'm in the process of, I've got all my other lenses now. I've purchased everything I need, except I need a landscape lens. And I'm going back and forth between the um, the Sony 16 to 35 uh, G Master and the 12 to 24. So uh, I was hopefully going to ask you that. But I just was going to say that your landscape work, I know we're all talking about this podcast is for real estate, but I think a lot of us do landscape. And we all all do landscape because we, we shoot exteriors. But um, I just think that uh, your work is is splendid. And uh, you've got some just memorable sh bucket list shots. You've got all the, the great shots that a landscape photographer wants to get. I think it's called that the keyhole. Is that what it's called on the coast? The, when the sun goes through the hole and I think it's in California, isn't it? It, it is. Yeah. In California. Yeah. The keyhole is it called? Uh, people call it keyhole arch. I think. Okay. Um, yeah. It's, it's kind of a miserable place to shoot because there's only a couple <laughs> of days a year where the light comes through that hole and it is. the Instagram yeah. crowd is armed and ready. And so I was there with about 150 of my best friends shooting that, but <laughs> Have you shot Firefall in Yosemite when the uh, sun hits and it looks like a river of fire? No, I, I, I know that vantage point. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. I try to shoot things. Um, I like going to some of the iconic places because I like to push myself to think about something new and fresh. But I, I typically try to go to places that are, you know, maybe not as frequently shot, just if for no other reason than I just kind of like enjoying the, the peace and calm of not being elbow to elbow with other folks. Yeah. Yeah. Well, great. And, uh, hey, uh, Brian, do you do you shoot a lot of landscape? I uh, traditional not landscape? as much as I yeah, no, occasionally. I don't want to say um, I do consistently. Um, I mean, the truth is, a lot of times I'll be driving to a shoot and I'll see something unbelievable, and I'll have my gear mm. in the car and I'll just stop and shoot it. Um, but I don't really go out to shoot landscape, but I do enjoy it and I like it a lot. So I probably should get into it. You know, every so often. Um, Every other year or so, I'll go to upstate New York where it's nice and quiet up there and uh, you know, I'll bring the cameras with me and I'll take some good shots up there. But yeah, I, I enjoy it. I have to get into it a little bit more. Well, I, uh, I, Greg, I've been to six continents in four years and I have always got my cameras and I'm a, a huge fan of, of what you shoot, landscape. And I think that the Lumenzia will dra dramatically help my uh, images. So I don't know if they'll save me any time though. I'll probably get in a hole and <laughs> spend three times as much time on them. I, yeah, thanks. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I kind of have like about a three or four hour window on a lot of my landscapes. Obviously, if you're shooting real estate, I have a fundamentally different workflow on a routine basis for that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, when I'm, you know, working on, you know, a few images like that, I really go to the nth degree. And that's probably 10 or 15 minutes of exposure blending and, you know, all sorts of other time on things like dodging and burning and stuff that really doesn't apply to real estate. But I think I found that as my uh, as my skills improve, I, I get faster, but then I just spend more time on high quality things. It's like you never, I never really get faster because I'm always willing to spend that little bit of a time to to make the image better. Do you ever go back uh, six months, a year, two years, five years later and re-edit an image? I do. I, I love doing that. The, the software too. gets better. My technique gets better. Yeah. My own personal goal as a photographer is to be able to look back every three months and see a noticeable improvement in my work. <laughs> and I mean, I, I really push myself on that. Um, most of the images you see on my website have been processed in the last two years. I really am just constantly trying to make things better. And um, I don't know, that's how we grow as photographers. So, you mm -hmm. know, you got you to find whatever it is that, that pushes you. Um, you know, I, I like to... Um, kind of cross train, if you will. So I mentioned before I've done weddings and product shoots and all sorts of other stuff. And I think a lot of times what makes my, you know, my landscape photography better is something I learned shooting, you know, a kid's soccer game or something like that. I mean, it's amazing what you can kind of learn. So I like kind of mixing things up and just always pushing for better. 
Yeah, I shot a wedding Saturday, and and uh, I'm I'm always mixing it up. I'm uh, I love sports, and I, I would get bored if I just did real estate. I couldn't do it. So, hey, I wanted to ask you one other question uh, since I'm I'm actually leaving, coming off of Nikon, but I see here that you shoot uh, with a D810. Just curious, um, landscapes. Do you uh, have you gone to the uh, H50, and what do you think of that? I have. I've, I've got two of them actually. I, I shoot with a backup body. Mm -hmm. um, I absolutely love that camera. And if, if I had to put my finger on a couple of things that I think are standouts about the D850 over the D810, it's not the image quality. I mean, the image quality is better in specific ways, but what I really like is the focusing is so much better. Mm -hmm. And that's both the autofocus in the camera as well as the ability to manually focus in dark environment. So if I'm shooting the stars at night, the LCD on the back of the camera has a lot less noise. And so it's just much easier for me to, to get nail that focus. Mm -hmm. um, so I wouldn't say when I shot perfectly with the D810 versus the D850, you would see a difference, but I'm more likely to shoot perfectly with the D850 because I'm, you know, getting more shots with perfect focus and, and things like that. So I, I love that camera. And it shows you're, you're sh also shooting Sony. Is that uh, something you're actively shoot? Yeah, you know, not really. Uh, I picked up the Sony to, ha you know, kind of try out mirrorless and go a little bit lighter. And what I found is it doesn't save any meaningful amount of weight for me. Correct. And <laughs> I, I don't like the controls because on Nikon, I got specific buttons for specific yeah. things. On Sony, I have a few less buttons and they're all generic numbers, you know, so I got to remember, oh, C3 is this and C1 is this. and I just find the ergonomics of it, uh -huh. I never work as fast. And I think some of that's just a lifetime of shooting yeah. Nikon, but I, I really prefer shooting with the Nikons because of the ergonomics. That said, the Sony image quality is every bit as good. It's amazing. Yeah. No, I will say it's been been hard to switch because um, I shot my wedding with a Nikon in my left hand and a Sony in my right hand, and and the Nikon is still absolutely more more comfortable in my hand as far as not physically, but I know where everything is because I've been doing it for so many years. But uh, with that said, I'm really excited about moving on. So anyway, back to uh, back to what we were talking about, Brian. Sorry to go off on the landscape trip. Yeah, well, I know in general <laughs> we're running low on time. So um, Greg, I know besides the fact that Lumenzi is very, very affordable, um, when I actually first purchased it, I thought I was surprised that uh, – I don't want to call it cheap, but how cheap it was. Um, so that being said, besides for the price, which I think is at the time of this recording is under 40 bucks, correct? It's uh, thirty nine ninety nine. Yep. So just, just slightly under forty bucks. Uh, <laughs> Save that penny. <laughs> but I know that you. Uh, we spoke about it earlier. You you're willing to offer um, some sort of discount to our listeners. So uh, you want to tell us about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for for a limited time, um, we'll we'll make this good for a week after the show airs. Uh, just use discount code uh, Shooting Spaces fifteen. So that's all one word, all caps. Shooting Spaces fifteen for uh, for fifteen percent off. Mm. Either uh, Lamenzi of the course or both. Great. All right, cool. And we'll definitely post that in the show notes also. Um, all right, cool. So before we just close it out, Greg, why don't you just, um, if you can, tell everybody how to find you, how to find out some more information on Lumenzio, whether it's your website. Um, I see you're on Instagram too. If you want people to follow you there, anywhere they can find out information on you, see your work, find out information on Lumenzio, your courses, and you know anything you have that you want to uh, give a plug to. Absolutely. Well, the hub of everything is my website, which is gregbenzphotography.com. That's G-R-E-G-B-E-N-Z photography.com. And uh, up top, you can find links to the various tutorials and Lumenzia. At the bottom, you can find links to things like my YouTube channel and Instagram, but everything kind of flows to the website. If you wanted to go right to uh, Lumenzia, it's gregbenzphotography.com slash Lumenzia, which is L-U-M-E-N-Z-I-A. And you have some awesome, uh, I guess you can call it a promo video, but it's a, you know, it's just a little uh, video showing what Lumenzi can do right on your page. So if anyone wants to just come in and see how the user interface looks and uh, get a feel for it, you know, please, I invite everyone to go look because mm -hmm. once you start losing, using it and you really learn and get proficient in it, which I am not yet, um, but me not being proficient, I already see the, uh, the immense value in, you know, a software like this. So definitely check it out. Yeah. And, and the examples you'll see on my site are primarily about landscape and cityscape. So anyone who's got any questions, you know, just 
drop me a line. I've got my contact info on the website. You can just shoot me an email if you get questions that are more specific to interiors or, or real estate. I know you guys face some uh, unique challenges and a lot of things uh, directly translate from landscape, but there's certainly some areas that are more unique. Mm-hmm. Awesome. All right, cool. Well, Greg, we want to thank you for coming on, teaching us a little bit about luminosity masking and telling us a little bit about your software. And then, uh, you know, we went off on a couple of tangents, but it's all in good fun. Um, but uh, thanks. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on, guys. Great. We uh, look forward to everybody out there. Please subscribe. Give us a thumbs up, thumbs down, and uh, check back and do the uh, Ask the Guys feature so you can ask a question. And who knows, we might have Greg back on with a question about uh, luminosity masking. So use that feature. Awesome. Yeah, we got a couple of questions this week. So we have a few uh, lined up in the queue, mm-hmm. which we'll have to get to. Great. So until right. next time. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, guys. Okay. Take care. Goodbye. This has been Shooting Spaces, a real estate photography podcast. Subscribe to this show and don't forget to leave us a review. You can also follow Rich and Brian on social media and at their website, shootingspacespodcast.com.